Hi, welcome to the Profit Builder video series. I'm Vicki Suter, your host, and I'm the author of the book, The Profit Bleed, How Managing Margin Can Save Your Contracting Business. And these video blogs are all about helping you grow a more sustainably successful contracting business. And for over 25 years, I've been helping contractors increase their profits, generate more time in their day, and reclaim and refine the joy in what they do again. And that's what this video series is all about. And my goal is to help give you the thinking to be able to understand how to do that in your business. And then I actually give you tools and resources that help you implement what it is the video is talking about. So I hope you enjoy today's Profit Builder video. So today is the second part of a two-part series that I'm doing on um, construction company succession planning. And in the first video I did, I interviewed Lewis Weir of Carmel Builders, who bought the business from his mom and dad. And today I have with me Barbara and Tom Weir, who are the owner, the original owners of Carmel Builders, who sold the business to their son Lewis. And I thought it would be really fun to, you know, Lewis, my interview with Lewis was super interesting to hear from his point of view as a, a uh, second generation buying the business from his mom and dad. Uh, but I thought, you know, it would be great to really hear from Tom and Barbara, what was their experience like? And what does it take as business owners to come to the conclusion that um, we, A, really are ready to sell our business, B, that we can sell our business, C, what is that like when we succeed it, when we succeed our business to the next generation when it's family? And, um, you know, they have a perspective that I'm excited to have them share with you about uh, what does it take to really do that and navigate it? And what were some of the challenges they faced and what would they do differently? And what did they do that has worked really well that they're happy with? So, um, so I'm just going to jump in. Tom and Barbara, thank you so much for being here and sharing your time and, and your experience with uh, uh, listeners. We are happy to be here. I'm going to just point out that our name is Wire. Right. It's not weird, although it's spelled weird, it's wire. <laughs> wire, I apologize. And, no problem. <laughs> um, you know what? And, it happens all the time. <laughs> and Lewis told me that when we interviewed the last time, and I got it right the last time, and then I kind of messed it up, so I apologize. All right, well, we're going to keep going. Yeah. Um, thank you for letting me know. So tell me a little bit about, uh, tell us a little bit about what brought you, you, you were in business for, um, how long when it was that you kind of came to the decision of, I want to sell my business? Was there something that precipitated it? Like, just kind of give us an idea of what was sort of the, some of the background of that. And then we'll kind of dig into what was that experience like for you? I would say it, it wasn't any one event or, or any one moment where a, a thought or idea came to me. Over a period of time, as I got older into the business, I would say, maybe 10, 15 years ago, uh, or prior to uh, retirement, I began to think, you know, how's this, how's this gonna end? You know, where, where are we gonna go with it? And, and Barbara and I discussed and said, you know, the ideal situation would be if one of our children would be interested in taking over the business and that they would uh, be able to buy it from us by funding our retirement, uh, and we could stay on as some consultants over a period of time and and uh, and it would fund our retirement and the business would continue on. So, Tom, can I just interrupt you for a second and ask you uh, a quick question? Were any of your kids at that point in the business, working in the business with you? And you have five kids, right? Yes. Five. Okay. I think well, all of them worked with us at one time or another part-time, college, uh, working in college, things like that. But in a direct answer to your question, nobody, uh, none of them had been, were working with us at that time uh, or in, indicated that they were even remotely interested in going forward and perhaps purchasing the business and running it uh, uh, when we were ready for retirement. So, so here you that, were. That you initial were ready, idea. Uh, you were ready to... Like, look at how, where's my exit strategy? You look at these five kids and go, nobody's working in the business, but maybe right. somebody wants to. So, so yeah, okay, so, so then what happened? 
Well, uh, as as it drew closer, we started floating. Uh, Lewis did come uh, come to work for us. I, I should say that came first. Lewis did come to work for us, and uh, through a series of events and decisions on his part, and uh, he started taking a, a genuine interest in the in the business. And we uh, we floated the idea past him several times, and at first it was well maybe I don't know it was lukewarm at best, but over time uh, the the uh, the idea began to grow with him. And actually, we had asked him to help us with our accounting systems after I came on board, which was in the fall of uh, two thousand and two. Um, I could see there was a lot of work that we needed to do to get our QuickBooks in better shape and to utilize it more fully. Lewis was trained with accounting when he had, he had received his degree and he knew a lot more about how to set this up than we did. So he moved back to the area, which was not part of our plan. It was something that just happened for him. And when he moved back to the area, we asked him if he would step into the office and work part-time for us to get things in order. Okay. At that time, we discussed, and I mentioned to Tom, I felt we needed another person working alongside of him uh, that could assist us with building our sales and increasing our sales. And so we spoke to him about that after he had been working part-time for a while. And he really gave it some thought and it was at that point he didn't give us a quick answer he gave it thought and like tom said at first he was a little like oh i don't know about that but then he came back and he said you know i've been thinking about this and yes i'd like to give it a try now a few years later he had a little bit of backpedaling that went on okay. you know, maybe we'll get to that later okay. but at that right. time he said yes he did want to do that so, okay all right and so you where we call it our restructuring at that yes. time. Okay. And, and at that going forward from that time, our day-to-day -day conversations and and uh, uh, started to go in that direction. We talked about well, when you when this happens, or you know, you can uh, this might be the case, or you might want to do things this way, and that way. It, it became part of our communication, our da daily, weekly, monthly communication. It, it's not a foreign subject anymore. It's okay. really when it started okay. becoming comfortable with. All right, great. So you realized you were looking to start to um, look at what's my retirement strategy and would any of the kids be interested in coming into the business? At first it was no, and then Lewis, who is your oldest, said, okay, yeah, maybe we can do this. Right. So then um, I, I know that from our discussion, uh, and also from Lewis. So how did you go, like, so just talk about how did that process then unfold in doing this? And I know that there were some things along the way that were kind of hiccups for you guys and, and just maybe talk a little bit, I mean, I'll dig a little bit deeper in terms of, you know, I think there's always the financial side of it and people are curious about that and what have you, but maybe if you could just like talk about how was this process for you once you, once you sort of came to okay, Lewis said yes, I'd consider this. Then how did that unfold for, the, for you guys? Well, I think we, we said at one point in time, we need to find somebody that can help us steer through this and navigate what this all means. Uh, and our first step with that really was being involved in a group called the Alternative Board. And I don't know if that's something you've ever heard of, but okay. it's an organization that gets like companies together and they're coached on what they need to do to establish a more successful company and a more well-balanced company and a, mm -hmm. a well everything that's involved in having a business a growing business and that certainly oh. includes the, the discussion of the financials too but planning goals and, and setting strategies so yeah, so so i joined the alternative board and through that, did, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. through that through that process uh we were led to the fact that we needed to find somebody that uh, couldn't help us navigate through this idea of succession. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, uh, we just amongst ourselves, I, I said, Look, why don't the three of us uh, each pick uh, somebody to interview, to talk and present uh, our thoughts to and, and see what, see what comes of it. How, how did you find somebody? 
Well, I selected uh, somebody. I, I was uh, very involved with our Milwaukee chapter of NARI and uh, had been involved in, in strategic planning uh, sessions there for uh, several years. And I said, I'm going to speak to the uh, facilitator who led the strategic planning uh, portion of, of uh, our work there for those years and, and see if I could get a referral. So that's how I chose my uh, person to bring to the table. Barbara? We had decided that we would each try to find a person. And mine kind of dropped in my lap. I went to a networking event and met Peter Gersh, who uh, at that time, the name of his company was Cathedral Consulting. Uh, since then, it's now Gersh Consulting. And uh, it, he, I really liked him. And uh, he explained to me the business that he was involved with and that he was a business consultant for small family-owned businesses specifically. Um, that was his specialty. And uh, I thought he would be an excellent choice for us to interview because I thought was each one of us would, our thought was we'd each have an opportunity to pick somebody and then we'd interview them together and, and come to a conclusion. Mm -hmm. And the person that Lewis chose was uh, someone that he had been referred right. to, as I recall, and then we, we interviewed them. He, now, was, he was a business coach. He was a he was a business coach. His focus was more on the accounting, the financial side of it. And the coach you had chosen, uh, they were all very good, and very skilled. The coach that you or the person you had chosen focused more on coaching itself. And developing strategy and leadership and leadership yes. and de yeah. development and that type of thing. Okay. Gersh Consulting, or at that time Cathedral, uh, seemed to have all of those attributes, and they had the added benefit of focusing on small businesses, family and, and fam family, family-owned businesses. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They okay. understood. It, it was clear to all three of us that he understood the dynamics mm -hmm. of what right. that was. Parents eldest son running a business, uh, the emotions, the dynamics uh, that okay. are involved there. He, he stood out. Uh, okay. So if, so, and I remember Lewis talking a little bit about this too. So the person that you chose, ultimately, it wasn't just somebody who had uh, coaching skills, business skills, the numbers kind of skills, but you were looking for someone who could understand that dynamic of that relationship of family and parents and children and seceding within your family and yes. those dynamics that would come up. So that's great. Yes. So you, you had somebody who had all of those other skills, but also right. who could understand right. um, and help you navigate through the, that piece of it. So that's a great transition actually to, so what was that process like in, in where were the, um, where were the kind of the sticking points for you and, uh, you know, as a family, like what, just kind of talk about that. Like what were those things? Because those are kind of the, I don't know what I don't know is going to show up for a lot of people. Yeah. yeah. Um, right. or, and that's really what it was. Yeah. We had a lot of help from Cathedral Consulting and Peter Gersh specifically. Uh, the company had a very well-developed system and it was called a family succession planning assessment process if I've got it right if right. not it was very close to that okay and uh, I they had very specific steps that we followed uh, to develop what we were to narrow down what we felt we needed to accomplish and it took quite a long time and uh, the very first part of it was personal interviews with us a couple of times where we were taken aside one by one and asked questions and some of them kind of on the personal side as far as your know, feelings and uh and then others that were more practical like what would we expect and what would we be hoping for mm -hmm. right. so what can you add to that well i think i think that the, he was particularly skilled and their system was particularly skilled in not allowing any of us to avoid uh, avoid anything. The difficult, the, 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 the touchy, difficult, the touchy, the touchy spots. questions, yeah, yeah. the, the oh, things that, we, questions. that you just knew were going to come across as a challenge, you know. <laughs> and did you want to face that, you know? Can you but just they, can you will you share a couple of those? 
Oh. Not to share necessarily your personal answer, but like, what were some of those tough? Because I um I like hard tough questions because I think yeah. they're the things that like really get at the juicy stuff that really drives our behavior and our beliefs, right? So, so would sure. you just share some? What are some of those questions that they asked that well, people who are listening to this might want to ask for themselves yeah. that maybe like, they haven't considered? Like specifics about uh, you know the, the money, you know uh, uh, how much money you want you know uh, how much money do you think you need how much money do you think you can afford to pay us uh, from our perspective uh, questions like that which are very direct and they're easy to ask um, in, in general to, to to people at, 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 a, at a business meeting or, or, or something but um, to talk to your sibling to, to your uh, children or your to your parents and uh and and say mm, you know that's a very direct question you, you shy away you kind of uh struggle with asking the question and getting a straight answer okay. and you know it's it's an interesting thing when you develop this relationship with your children because no matter the age of your children you still are parent child to some extent mm -hmm. and particularly when it comes to uh, mutual ownership and developing a program where your child is going to be taking over your baby in a way because that's a, that's what it is you know yeah. this company started had very humble beginnings and has grown to a very successful company so it's kind of like it was been our baby and so the questions were did ask things like how much involvement do you think you are going to need after you pass over succession or how and the transfer mm -hmm. of ownership takes place do you feel that you will want to be involved in the fam in the business directly um does it bother you the thought of being told what to do by <laughs> your child uh things things like that that's a good one you yeah. know it was, yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's been quite a while now since we've been through the process yeah. and we've been fully retired now for a few years. And so it's sort of hard to remember the specifics, but it just got, it really dug into those things that are, that can really hit you in a spot that you didn't expect, I guess. Yeah, and, and your answers to those things can come, you're, you're kind of sensitive to the fact that what I'm about to say is gonna sound very blunt mm -hmm. and I don't want it to be, and I don't. And, and you see the reaction, and you can see it coming, and you and you hem and haw, and you back off a little bit. And the great thing with our consultant, with Peter, was he would gently and and steadily just keep pushing it through, pushing it forward, and and help disarm things, and and put out a little a little spark that's going to flare up here, you know, put out the fire before it gets going. Uh, and just gently and but firmly just mm -hmm. keep us moving and 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 holding our feet to the fire use that same analogy yeah that's uh, great yeah. That's and we great. wanted to keep things very as even keel as possible because as I think I explained to you before we have always felt that the primary issue we did not want to happen was to have some kind of family rift that would create that would damage our relationships because right. we have a very close family we're very blessed with that and we're very grateful for that uh, and we didn't want anything to get in the way of that and so we wanted to be sure that going through this process didn't do any damage that we we're able to speak honestly and frankly without wounding each other Right. And, uh, saying something that we would regret and mm -hmm. you know, through our emotions or anything like that. So mm -hmm. we, uh, the, the, it was a, that general sort of difficulty, if you, if you want to call it that. But again, I, I put all the tribute to our consultant. Uh, he was so skilled at yeah. just well, keeping, us, keeping us on track. It sounds like he was very good at helping you facilitate, as you so um, nicely described, what was challenging and difficult conversations and conversations at the level that you want to keep those relationships intact 
Um, yeah. Obviously, especially with your children, it's um, that relationship is more important than any business. Right. And the, but I also really appreciate that you know I'm listening to you and and as a uh, I, I'm I have a very direct personality, mm-hmm. and I um, I tend not to shy away from money and number conversations because I, you know, I have this belief about numbers that they always tell a story and they illuminate things. And it's like, it brings the sense of clarity and confidence. And one of the things I appreciate in listening to the two of you is that um, that can be very difficult for people and it can be difficult to ask for what you want. It can be difficult for you to say a number out loud that you're like, you know, how's that going to be held with somebody else? And is that a reasonable number? And, and I even appreciate it to the degree that, you know, when you think about it, that this is what happens even in, con- in sales conversations and business. Sure. When we're talking with people about money and they're like, am I going to offend them when I tell them my budget number? Or, right. Uh, right. you know, oh, yeah. so it's, it's a, that thing of um, how do we navigate our way through this? And, and again, especially with family. So it sounds like your, uh, your facilitator and coach did a great job in helping you. I liked what you said that he kept pushing the conversation gently forward and really, um, creating a safe space for you to be able to answer the questions sure. that it's would it's have otherwise kind of been uncomfortable to talk about. So um, I'm, 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 I might add to this too, that th- this is one of the things that surprised me about this process because in my business, on my business side, the, like the example you just brought up about speaking to a homeowner or a customer or a client, I had no problem with that. You know, the numbers, this is the way it is. This is, but here I discovered, I'm talking to my son, it, it kind of, it kind of floored me how, how tentative I was and, yeah. and it, it uncovered, it uncovered that within myself that I was not aware of. And it was just, a, I think a, a sensitivity that I had towards him and with him. Uh, for him and, and and everything, I get again that is only there because of father son relationship. Sure, sure. Yeah. No, I think the one thing that's important for people to understand, though, Vicky, is that this takes time and it takes a commitment and it takes money. And I, we have been a successful company, but we certainly were not rolling in dough. We're much more farther ahead in our financials than we were when this started. So it was a big commitment for us. And I don't know if your clients being on the West Coast and where you are in San Francisco area, if that's an issue. But I think it's important to at least mention it because <laughs> if you or because some people, no matter where they're at, <laughs> are going to balk at the money. Mm-hmm. And I, it, because they go, what do I want to spend that? I don't know what I'm doing in this business. Why, why should I have to do that? You know, that, that's a, I think that's a fairly common attitude. I can take care of this. I don't need to spend that kind of money. Well, <laughs> I think you have to be willing to make a commitment. Certainly you have to be within your level of comfort. Um, but I think that's a big issue. The that's time, the, the commitment, and the money it takes it's to do this. It was money well spent. Yeah. No question oh, about it. I mean, never, I would never look back on yeah. that. It was, uh, yeah. we realized uh, we got an incredible value for the money that we spent yeah. on doing it. That's we, correct. Could not, we could not have done it. That's way. great. And it's interesting because people in our industry, that's what they're selling is the value. You know, it's the value. Of what right. It's right. not just that it's, it's the product. Yes. It's the service. It's yes, way it's more beyond value. price. Yeah. Right. So, right. Yep. Um, you, so one of the things when we had been talking um, originally as we were preparing for this interview, you guys talked about um, getting your financial house in order. Uh, during this process. Can you just speak to that and what did that, what does that mean and what did that involve? Okay, uh, I'll jump in first. Yes. Mm-hmm. The Carmel Builders started uh, back in 1979 as a one-man show, me, and I kind of grew, grew with it uh, and wore all the hats of uh, production, sales, and business management. And then as time went on, I brought on people and, uh, and, and it continued to grow. Uh, the recession in 08 really, we were doing very well in 
uh, oh, se six or oh, seven, and 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 it was at that time I was really starting to think, wow, this is we're, this might be a good time to start thinking about retirement. Uh, uh, and and financially we were we were really flying high. Oh eight hit, and the bottom fell out for us here in the Midwest, and this Everywhere. is when uh, things really re really got tough. Um, where am I going? <laughs> Well, I'm just saying, so I was asking tonight. about the financial, so you getting oh, your yes. financial yes. house in order, you had talked about that that was part of what you did in this process. Sure. So in, in recovery from that in, in the next several years is when I think Barbara used that term about recovering, getting our financial house in order. Uh, the whole idea in 08, 09, and 10 about retirement was put on hold then uh, because we had to recover. We had to get our finances. Uh, up in order and and get back, regain the things that we lost in our investments. Well, and beyond that, yes, we had to first of all just keep things going, you know. And it was right. a matter of survival, really, and and to that we wanted to make sure everything was okay. And gratefully, because of our reputation, we weathered that that storm really quite well, a lot better than most people did. And um, what we needed to do, however, was to continue to look at how do we keep the ball rolling? How do we continue to stay healthy financially? That process began with the alternative board and it, it moved into Cathedral Consulting as we went through the succession planning. And again, that Peter and his process took us to the next level. Lewis had a lot of knowledge of this, which was extremely beneficial as well. Yeah. So what did that involve? Like, so what did that involve when you're when you were doing this with the consulting team, and when Lewis came in and helped you? Like, was that like you put an operating budget in place? Because I know there were some things about the yes. elements of this that had to do yeah. with you knowing that the company could produce a certain. Because I'm going to ask you in a second about how did you structure the financial side of this, because there were elements, as I recall you telling me and Lewis too, that um, there were elements about getting the profitability of the business at a certain level and when you talk about level. financial house yeah. order that related to your ability to be able to comfortably go, I'm going to make this deal with you, but I got to know that you can consistently produce a consistent profit. So what were the thing, the kind of things that you did that allowed you to do that? Well, we, uh, P Peter has established a financial dashboard and at every board meeting, and we were having them every month at this point, and for many years. Um, we started with Cathedral Consulting, we determined at the end of 2013, and we did not complete the actual succession plan until 2016, uh, at the end of 2016, when it was really finalized and the papers were drawn up. So we, one of, one of the things that he did was have this financial plan, um, um, Dashboard, dashboard that helped us take a look at where we are with our sales, with our overhead, uh, with our gross income, our net income. We went through that every single month and we had specific goals put in place. Okay. Um, we were working to achieve specific goals and we were, had metrics that we were evaluating. And, okay. you know, we looked at the, um, the, and of course, now the names of these things are just totally flying out of my head because I want to talk about them. <laughs> um, but we looked at the uh, financials of, of cash flow, um, the um, P&L, and the, um, uh, what's the other one? Uh, balance sheet. Uh, balance, balance sheet. sheet. Yeah. And we looked at that every month. And we all compared it to the previous year. And we... We're very scrupulous budget. with taking a look at that. And the budget, what, have we been on target with our budget that we had set? We became more fastidious about setting our budget and tried to be very realistic. Where can we pull in a little bit? Where must we let go a little bit? It was that whole process. And again, that was where we received a lot of help from Peter because he was very good at keeping us on task. Our Those once a month board meetings at that time would it wasn't uncommon for them to go for two to three hours regularly. And the first half was financials. We, yeah. we spent all of our time just drilling into everything. 
So I love uh, what you're talking about because I, I mean, I talked to, this is a lot of the work that I do with mm -hmm. clients is right on what you're talking about is that ability to start to um, build a set of feedback systems, first set goals, right? And right. Then create um, feedback systems so that you're measuring your results against those <laughs> goals and then managing the gap between where you are and where you said you want to be. And yeah. What it does is it gets a more, it allows you to create a more consistent result to start to have a better discipline about how you're managing results in your business. It really, but yes. If I recall what you said, part of what was important to you about that was that that's also the thing that let you know that if that system was in place mm -hmm. in the business, that that discipline would continue when you weren't there day in and day out, month in and month out to have those meetings, although I believe you said you're still involved with those meetings, but that um, it, what it does is it produces a more consistent result okay. in your business so that you can count on that result more. So, I mean, I just want to kind of earmark this for anybody who's listening, because I think it's a super important point about when uh, you're looking to sell the business and you're going to be bought out over time or you're going to have, and I'm going to ask you this, we're, I'm going to, we'll talk about how you arranged the financial side of your succession plan with, with Lewis in a second. But the thing about being able to count on that the business is continuing to generate a profit that can pay you, uh, mm -hmm. that that next generation is buying you out with, that when you set your financial house in order and you set goals and you manage against those goals, you're developing that muscle of discipline for managing for results and it will produce a more consistent results. So Absolutely. Uh, and I, it did. that's great. Yeah. It did and it continues to yeah. do so. That's great. We meet now once a quarter as opposed to once a month and our meetings are much shorter, you know, and it's, yeah, you got that discipline. You got that. Well, down, you yeah, know? That was a real yeah. process. And uh, you yeah. know, it's something that was, we really uh, had to labor through sometimes, you know, and, mm -hmm. but it was very beneficial to us. So yes, we had a certain idea in mind of where we wanted our sales to be before we made this stuff. And uh, so we had to go through that process. Well, among other process. things, sales, among, uh, sales, sales was one of the and, and other structures. It's one of the indicators business, that we're looking at. Right. Business right. development and, and standard operating procedures, et cetera. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, we, it was really worthwhile. <laughs> everything, awesome. everything, it came through, we came through, everything really flows out of the numbers. I mean, mm -hmm. what, once, you know, once you know the numbers, yeah. And, and, and you can look at the numbers and see what they mean and where, where they've been and where they are and where, they, where you want them to be. Everything flows out of that and, and mm -hmm. it just makes a lot of sense. And as Barbara said, we learned all of that. Uh, I thought we understood the numbers, but this was a whole awakening for Not us. Well you know? Not well <laughs> one enough. Not well enough. One of the things that I always say is that um, when you have the practice of managing by results and you manage by the data and by the numbers, yeah. what it does is it gives us more clarity. And when we have more clarity, we have more confidence. And we have more confidence, we make more powerful, we take more powerful actions. We make more powerful and, and spot on decisions about business. And, and uh, so good for you for, for taking so that All of this out. emerged yes. out of this for us in that way. And, and the confidence and the decision making of where we're, how we're going to uh, do the succession, the emerge and, and and it really came out of that structure. As Barbara said, we were meeting for several years with Peter, reviewing the numbers and going, and, and all of it came together with that. You know, we, that was always our basis. That's great. That's great. Well, so let's uh, the, kind of transition this a little bit. Tell me, tell us how you um, ended up structuring the buyout. So there's lots of different ways that one stru can structure a buyout. Uh, and just share with us, if you will, how you approached this. Well, again, we followed uh, we followed our consultant who laid out several ideas and ways that he had done done worked with other family families and uh, laid out a number for us. And and actually, what we uh, the model we chose was to have uh, two different classes of stock of, of voting shares 
and non-voting shares. And um, the voting shares actually control, uh, were dealt with the controls of the company. Uh, and Barbara and I uh, each received a third, or uh, 30% of the, those shares. So that was for a total of 60%. And Lewis received 40%. So in a coalition of, of decisions or control, um, Barbara and I together would hold the majority. So but that's interesting. So you, what you're talking about is uh, you own less of the company, which I want, I want you to talk about here in a second. I know you right. own 6%, right? And then Lewis owns 94%. Yeah, correct. In terms, of, yeah. Uh, in terms of the shares, uh, that relate to profitability, but then there's this other arrangement that you established that has to do with voting shares. Yes, right. right. What that did, if I hear you correctly, is it allowed the two of you to still have a senior voice in how the company was run, yes. or that the company couldn't be sold or couldn't be, uh, you know, there couldn't be some major significant decision made about the business and the structure of the business and the entity without you guys weighing in on it at 30% right. each, right. uh, even the, so that you could feel like you still um, were able to support the overall success of the company going forward and that you yeah, weren't just right. leaving it to, you know, like who knows, Lewis has a bad day or whatever and, right. Right. and gets sick of it and goes, I'm out of here and sells it. We couldn't yeah. do that because yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Have the majority voting shares. That's yes, correct. Yes. That's that correct. Is and that was the, the primary purpose of that, really, because we, our majority of voting shares does not allow us to interfere with the day-to-day -day operations. Okay. You know, we really have no, no yeah. voice in that. And we are there to assist, to advise, to discuss, to be creative in th our thought process and help, you know, have our experience, as it will, provide some benefit to mm -hmm. Lewis. Right. But we can't make the decision. And so from an operational yeah. point of view, you can't. But when it comes to a, like the things that of a corporate yeah. that require corporate voting. Yes. Okay. yes. All right. We yeah. review, we're supposed to be reviewing Lewis on an on a annual basis, too, as a board. Which we, How's that, which that we haven't, Well, we haven't really done it. We, and we realized that we, we hadn't really done it. And we discussed that at a board meeting. Um, I believe at our last board meeting, and we decided we should do that at the end of the year. Great. And that there should be something that, that there should be a review of Lewis by the board, mm -hmm. and uh, it's probably going to be all good, <laughs> but you know, it's, a, it's just our, a good idea. Our, our former consultant, uh, 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 Peter, uh, also sits on the board as a non-voting member, yeah. uh, non-voting on anything. He's Bless simply is there as a An advisor. But it, that's that's been a great transition for us because in the day in the month to month and yearly operations of on the board level, having Peter's experience, uh, where all of us are comfortable are comfortable with him, know him so well, that's uh, great. It's been immeasurably helpful throughout that too, yeah. steering us through little touchy subjects and things. Yeah, yeah. So to, uh, so Again, we're still family. Yeah, exactly, right? So would yeah. you talk about the financial? How did you end up, what's the financial arrangement you ended up with? Sure, I would. In the buyout, like what's the, tell me the num us the numbers piece of it. Well, the numbers piece that, that we, we determined that the value of the company is one times the, one times the gross profit of the year before. Okay, so that's the actual value of the company. However, the reality is that Tom and I, after uh, 35 years at that time, 35 years of being in the business, did need to have a substantial buyout in order to keep our financial situation in place. Mm -hmm. And we had an assessment of what we needed based on our retirement monies, based on our social security, and based on what the company could give us. And we determined a specific number of what we felt we would need to continue the lifestyle we had spent the last 35, well, plus years sure. uh, developing. And 
And so that was the income, actually. We that was the income. That, that would, our yearly income would need to be from okay. the company. From the company. So you figured out how much you needed, and then how did you structure the deal? Well, we're on the board of directors, and we get paid very nicely for being on the board of directors. Okay. And that's really what happens. And that protected, it protects us, and it protects Lewis. It's a firm number. It's part of his, it's below the line, but it's a, an expense that's non-negotiable. It's, it's there. And it, uh, I should say, in theory, non-negotiable. Um, we would always be willing to discuss it if, if the need would if arise. It meant, if, it, if, the, if the survival of the company was somehow hinged to it. Okay. That, and is there a time frame for that or is it, so you own six, per, you, how you structure the percentage ownership, you still own 6% of the bottom line, but you get paid a, a salary basically for right. being a board member. Yeah. Is there a time frame for when that goes out until, or is it indefinite or? Well, we have a couple of scenarios based upon uh, uh, both of us being uh, alive, one of us not being alive. Uh, so that was all written into the agreement as well. So we covered, we covered a lot of different scenarios as far as time-wise went. Okay. So you yeah. structured it so that the company is giving you a salary and profits of your 6%, those distributions. You figured out first, how much money do I need? And then how do we structure a deal within the business so that the business... Can we do still it. have some involvement, right? right. Uh, we still have voting shares. The yes. business gives us a salary for our involvement, and the salary and the profits are sufficient to cover what is our personal, you know, right. financial needs. Okay. And and it also it, it was something that was acceptable to Lewis too, because then did, he did not have to come up with a chunk of money. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did decide we, this is uh, nothing that's written into our bylaws, but we did decide we would reevaluate as time moved on. And as we determined that our needs were less, you know, we're still in relatively good health. We have, we think quite a few years to go yet. And um, we want to enjoy these years. We've worked hard to, to be, to enjoy these years. But after that stage of our life moves on, we won't have the same level of needs. So we'll, we'll look at it. You know, we, we will discuss these things and we'll be open okay. to it as long as we're, we uh, just, Tom and I just finished completing our, our uh, will and our powers of attorney, make sure everything's in order there. It's all wrapped up with our trust, everything else. We've got all those ducks in a row now. Uh, and we feel very, really pretty good about where everything's standing right now. But it was, took a lot of work and a lot of time. I'll, I'll, I, I got to add one thing too, uh, something that really uh, struck me through this process, and especially as we were starting to talk about the uh, uh, the cost uh, to the company and and the income for ourselves, I, w I was really struck by the fact that uh, how how much care and concern Lewis had for us, and he wanted to make sure. And he's checked up on that several times since. Is this working? Uh, are things going uh, going well for you? Is this as we had hoped it would be, and and yeah. and, and that was very yeah. important, and and you know, and it really, in a way, kind of surprised me. We never talked about stuff like that before, but then to have him ask me those kind of questions yeah. with, with really, I amazing. was uh, I was really struck by that um, the very first time I ever talked to Lewis, and every time since then, and we've probably chatted a half a dozen times. Uh, that is consistently just shown up in his conversation, not like a point he was making, but just his care and concern for the two of you and that you were taken care of and that, and not from a, like a coddling place, but from a right. place of really respect and appreciation for the many years that went into building this business, what it took for you and the courage it took to create the business and to start the business and grapple with all of the starting a business and keeping a business successful and, and the transition that you went through. I mean, like he just has such a deep appreciation and respect for that that is so evident in, in his communication about 
this whole transition with you guys and um i think it's admirable and oh it is uh, yeah we, we're felt well yeah. we know we're we know we're very fortunate like yeah, we, we said we, that, we, you we know are. but but sometimes it takes something like this to really bring it home yeah you know when you yeah. see yeah how how sincere sincerely he cares and yeah. yeah you learn a whole nother thing that, about but, your kids you know, right just, yeah right yeah. 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 now i just there's one final thing that i i would like you uh, to ask you about um because i think this is a super important piece in terms of uh the transition you know there's three different levels of of transition that you're you're going through here right one is just the legal shifting of the entity uh which is kind of a while it required a whole lot of things that happen in the background from an operational point of view it is not as significant for your for your team and for your your organization and the more important two pieces that affect your organization day in and day out are the management and then the leadership and management is i'm moving into the role of being a manager as i'm working my way up the ranks but then leadership is this whole other piece of mm -hmm. i'm the one that has the final say and that that's where i see there's like that's where there's a big transition or a challenge or the thing that really needs attention if you will within an organization making this change of leadership whether it's succeeding to the next generation of family or the next generation of employees that transition of um, shifting from tom in your case tom's the guy who's the final word and barbara to lewis is the final word it's lewis's trajectory of where we're going and what we're up to and it's not uh tom and barbara's anymore can you just speak to how did you navigate that and what you know, what advice do you have for people about how to do that successfully? Well, uh, yeah, that's uh, that was that wasn't as difficult for me as I as I maybe thought it might be. Mm -hmm. uh, I really just wanted to uh, leave that behind, and I kind of said to myself uh, right from the start, I'll involve myself to whatever degree I'm asked. Uh, and and try to use that as my discernment as opposed to jumping in and saying hey i hear this and that is going on i think you should do this you should do that or uh or anything we we try to just deal with things at our board meeting and we and we keep it keep it to the point of uh we're not going to do we're not going to do any managing we're not involved in management we're looking at we're looking at end results with the numbers, how how do things put together? How did how how were the goals met, et cetera, et cetera? And we'll we'll address them on a board level uh, through uh, good communication. Early on, though, Tom, how did you guys navigate that with your team? Because by that point, you've got a whole team of people that are in place. As you're you know you're bringing Lewis in, you're in the you know this three year cycle of mm -hmm. working through this process. Mm -hmm. And it's during those three years when you made the transition of Lewis going from employee to manager to leader. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm talking about. Like, so with the team, how we did didn't really have, we didn't really have a, like a, a drop off point and a starting point for one thing. We, it was a process. Uh, I often uh, talk to people and they ask you, how did you deal with retirement? How about the day you retired? I don't even know what day I retired. I, I don't even remember when I really retired. It was, I faded away. Uh, okay. I just, was the reason. Does this mean we need to tell Lewis he needs to give you a retirement party? <laughs> he kind of did. He did. He, did. he kind of he did, did when he went down to, to receive that, that national award. Yeah, it was a bit of a retirement party oh, right. event. Yeah. Right. But Tom, I think it's important to mention that Tom had had a health issue that came up before that. Sure. And it, it precipitated the need that he had to back off. Yeah, you know, okay. the stress of, of the daily, and and he did, Tom. Uh, and even before that, Tom's not your typical family business owner. He's, he he never felt this sense of propriety in letting go and giving this authority uh, to his. I was grateful. Son. Grateful. It, it, he was grateful, yeah, and and he didn't have trouble detaching, which I think is highly irregular. 
You know, I don't think that's typical. I think I had a harder time than Tom did. Okay. I was still working for several years after he retired. And I just decided once we actually completed the, the, um, the execution of the succession plan and all the, the legal work was done, um, I realized that I would have a real struggle answering to him and not that it would be best if I would be out of the way because I didn't want to create those kind of that any um, dissension and I knew that I would be butting heads with him you know so I said okay it's time for me to really fully retire yeah okay. as opposed to what I planned which was to work part-time I think I think the fact that we had were also interested in our own self-interest that the company succeed uh, you know, uh, yes. that, that we wanted that more than anything else. We really yeah. wanted that, and we didn't want to get in the way. And so mm -hmm. it was easier to say, okay, what would you like me to do? Or can I help with this or that? As opposed to jumping in because uh, it, it, we, we wanted to safeguard our own interests as well. Mm -hmm. sure. mm -hmm. And that's the way everything was set up and structured. So we, we had to let go. We just... And I wanted to. <laughs> I was relieved. Yeah. Well, um, you did a great job. Um, and I think this is probably a good place for us to wrap this up. Um, I, thank you. I think that uh, the kind of information and, and just listening to the two of you, what you've shared uh, today, I think is going to be super helpful and valuable to other people who are facing this transition in their business. Uh, so thanks so much, Barbara and Tom, for your time. I really Thank appreciate you. it. And um, for those of you listening, um, I'm going to uh, repost what is the 12 tips for succession planning that I posted in part one of this video series. I hope you found today's video helpful. If you're ready to take your next step in your leadership journey and to build a great contracting business, I encourage you to check out my book, The Profit Bleed. It's full of great tools and resources that will help you implement the processes and the systems and the structure that will allow you to build a more profitable business, allow you to work less hours, and help you reclaim the joy and fun in your business and in your life again. And for a limited time, you can get my book for free. All you have to do is pay $7.95 shipping and handling. And you simply need to go to theprofitbleed.com forward slash free. Thanks again for joining me for today, and I look forward to seeing you next time on The Profit Builder. <laughs>